Welcome, everybody. Donna Russo Savage, uh, I'd like to start by introducing. Um, Donna was for a long time our legislative assistant on this committee uh, and was a fantastic resource for us for a long time and is now working at AOE. And before Donna starts, I just want to clarify what we are doing today and what we're not doing today. I understand a lot of people um, have come to hear the testimony today. I think that's all to the good. I want to make it clear that this is not a hearing on the individual actuated proposals of Act 46 with testimony on both sides about whether the map should look this way or that way. What we're doing here today is what we've done with uh, the special ed law and what we'll also do with the statewide bargaining law, which is we're talking with the agencies that are uh, in charge of implementing those about what's gone on and what progress there's been. And then in other moments, we're going to be taking testimony from the people who are, um, who are affected by that. In this case, the plaintiffs in the three ongoing lawsuits have lawyers who are making their arguments uh, publicly available so my sense is that the proper venue right now for people who have a grievance with either AOE or the state board is at law through their hired attorneys. So today is not a hearing where we're hearing both sides about Act 46. It's simply a progress update about where we stand from the agency's point of view and the state board's point of view. So with that said, uh, Donna, if you could just introduce yourself and if you would just um, let people know when you left Ledge Council what job you stepped into and uh, what your responsibilities were and then go into the next Certainly. So I was with I was with Legislative Council for 16 years, and the last nine of those, as um, Senator Bruce said, was with the Education Committees. Um, and as you know from your own um, Legislative Council, um, our, our role here is strictly nonpartisan. When, when I worked for Legislative Council, when I moved to the Agency of Education, that was my understanding of my role there as well. I was there in a in a in a role of helping implement a law that the legislature had acted. I went over specifically to help with the implementation of Act 46 and its related laws because there was a lot of confusion. It was a new law, it was complex, and, um, and my role was not to say this is a good idea or a bad idea, but this is what the legislature has passed, and this is our best understanding of how to proceed with it. So in my role during the last three years, I have talked with superintendents, school board members, people who are in favor of merger, people who are not in favor of merger, and have just tried to provide whatever information I have without providing legal counsel to those people, whatever information I have um, to, to help them understand what the law, what our best understanding of the law um, in its current iteration says. And that's that's what I'm here today, too, is just, I, I think um, I spoke with Senator Ruth a little bit earlier. I think that I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what has happened. I've got several different handouts that hopefully will just kind of lead you through to where we are now. That's okay. So the first one, if you could just pass those down, and Jeannie, I've got the other. And again, these handouts will show up on our website probably by the end of the day, so you can. And most, yeah, most of these things are things that people have seen before. I just tried to put them all together so that we could go through it. This is the map of districts as they existed in um, July one of 2015, um, and as you can see, it's it's you know very much a patchwork that the um, the in in the. Uh, um, down here in, in, the, in the key, each of the different kinds of um, whether a district operated or tuitioned certain grades is indicated. So each of these different kinds of hash marks, colored hash marks, indicate what grades that particular district paid tuition for. That's, that's the way this is indicated. So um, uh, if you see a number of, let's go up here to, um, to I, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on. Um, well, up here, the blue, Lamoille. 
um, th it's all blue. That that if it's all a single color within a um, a green barrier, that means that they have a Union High School. But each of those individual towns had at the time had its own. Um, individual school board, school district, um, that, that in this particular case, because there are no hash marks, you know that the elementary school district um, operated all grades. Um, so th this just kind of gives you a, a feeling of, you know, wh what it looked like at the time as far as operating and tuitioning and how many different school districts um, there were in the state. And I'll give you some statistics about that. This is, um, it's down at the very bottom, and I think it was um, 11, uh, 2015 is I think when it was actually printed. <clears throat> the next document is, uh, well, uh, actually, let me just back up, so um, because you're not all as familiar with the process as I am. In um, 2010, the um, legislature enacted Act 153, which did a number of things, including it established a, um, a program to encourage districts to form unified union school districts. Unified union school districts are pre-K through 12. Doesn't mean they have to operate pre-K through 12, but it means that they have to be responsible for pre-K through 12. Um, and in order to encourage the creation of pre-K uh, pre through 12 districts, um, in 2010, the legislature um, uh, enacted Act 153, which created the initial program, which people referred to as the RED program, Regional Education District Program. Um, there was some interest in that. There were a couple of votes. The votes were not favorable. There was um, one that was created under that program initially called the Mountain Town Reds that was later pulled into another larger district later. Um, but in, hello. Um, but in general, um, it, 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 there, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, testimony to the to the legislature that it really wasn't being effective because it didn't it didn't take into account various um, realities on the ground. And so, so Donna, I just want to clarify for Chris that welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I was hoping that Donna could do her <clears throat> whole spiel and yeah. answer questions, and then we'd move to you. But um, sitting there is great. Yes. No. Perfect. Thank you. So um, in 2012, the legislature came back to this and, and, and enacted three additional programs encouraging districts to merge um, that were variations on that original RED program. And all four of those um, programs continue to exist. It wasn't until 2015 when Act 46 was created that they all got pulled together with additional laws that the legislature enacted in Act 46. So Act 46 created a continuum. It pulled in those old laws those old programs, but it also created new programs. So it ended up that there were three um, programs that were encouraging districts to, to, to merge on their own, to go to their voters and, and get approval to, to merge on their own. Um, the first one was, a uh, first time-wise one, was one that at the agency we, um, we generally refer to as phase one, the accelerated program. That was created in Act 46, and that required very rapid action. Um, the second, what we considered phase of the voter approved mergers occurred um, by pulling in all those older laws. So there was the RED um, program, there was what you've probably heard of referred to as the MUDS program that were side by sides. There were different kinds of programs that were attempting to um, uh, address that there, there are different kinds of... Um, Just uh, for people who are new to the discussion, can you... Um Explain red and mud quickly. Sure. A red um, was uh, in order to be eligible for the tax rate reductions and um, and other transitional assistance. Uh, a red required either that four existing districts merged into a single district that was responsible for pre-K through 12 or it could be a smaller number as long as the average daily membership was it. And all these numbers changed so much. I think it was 1,200, but I'm not sure. It might have been 900 then, at that yeah, time. Yeah, it went to 1,200 yeah, to 900. It, yeah, it, it, somewhere between 12 and 900. I can't recall it right now, which it was. The, uh, so that was one that was in 2010 and was pulled into Act 46. Um, another one that was pulled into Act 46, there were three that were in the, um, uh, in, in, 2012, one of them was what we call the MUDs, and that allowed, it's, it's very difficult to explain. I actually have a nice little diagram that I can bring in if you want to talk about it at some point, or I can give it to Jim. But it, it, it's a situation where there are a number of union elementary school districts, all of which operate elementary schools. All of them are members of a union high school. Um, and what happens when all of them, except perhaps one of the, of the 
local elementary school districts does not want to join. A MUD allowed all of them to join as to the high school grades and just the districts that wanted to join joined as the, as the elementary school grades. So you have a situation where it's a single district that is pre-K through 12 for all of the districts that voted yes, but is something less than that, is 7 through 12 or 5 through 12 or whatever for the district that voted no. The district that voted no then um, retained its own um, town school district for whatever those elementary grades were. So that was that was one of the other, uh, that was one of the um, uh, options that, that was a variation on the red. Another variation on the red was that there were, were going to be certain times when um, there weren't going to be four districts that had the same operating tuitioning structure altogether, so it was impossible to create a red. Um, and the, in, the, in one of these additional options that the legislature provided in 2012, they created the side-by-side -side program, which would allow um, at least two districts that were the same next to at least another two districts that were the same, both of them forming their own single union elementary school district. I mean, excuse me, unified union school district. So you ended up with, um, instead of, for example, four districts, you ended up with two newly merged districts right next to each other. That was another version. Uh, and both of those, both the MUDs and the, and the side-by-sides and the REDs all were part of what came into Act 46 and you'll see here were, were something that um, were, were taken advantage of. Um, the, another one that was not taken advantage of was the opportunity to form a union elementary school district, and, and no one took advantage of that opportunity. So there were three phases of these voter-approved um, um, merger programs that uh, were, cre were created or incorporated by Act 46. There was this accelerated one, which was phase one. There, phase two were, was pulling in these others that had been enacted in the past. And the third phase was essentially like the first phase, but it didn't have to be quite as fast. Um, so um, all of this had to be, I'm not going to go into the third phase because there were none created in that and it was a, the timing was a little odd. But what all of these required was that districts that were created were, would be operational no later than July 1, 2019. Many of them were operational earlier than that. There are still some that are not yet operational. Um, so I'm going to pass out. This is a list. This is very similar to a handout that was attached to the, um, um, the secretary's proposal. Would you give us Jeannie, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, but it's, it's updated a little bit. So this is a list of all of the voter-approved um, unified union school districts. So, so these were approved under those phases I was just talking about, either an accelerated phase or a, um, a, a MUD or a side-by-side -side or, or a RED. And what it does is it, it lists the name of each un, um, new unified union school district. It identifies what their um, K-12 operating and tuitioning patterns are. It says what the original SU was, and in those cases where not every district within the SU merged, it, it um, identifies those in, an, in a parenthetically italicized. And then the final column is the date on which they became fully operational. There were a few that became fully operational in 2016. Um, <coughs> most of them were, most of them were actually 2018. Uh, July 1, 2018, and there are, there are a handful both in 17 and um, and this year. So that's that's what this is, and you can, you know, it, it's just data. It's, it's you can peruse it at your pleasure. And is there? A, oh, I don't see a legend here for the T's and O's. T and O is I'm sorry. Um, the T is they pay tuition, and the O is they operate. So if it says K-12-0, it means that district operates K-12 for all of its students. If it says in Caledonia Cooperative School District, which is one, two, three, yeah. four down, they operate several schools that offer K-8, and they tuition 9-12. It's yeah. like a choice to um, so, but they are a single district with multiple towns, and all of those students are the same. Another thing I should say is, is that we've, in all of the data that I'm going to give you, we talk about K-8 even though these are actually pre-K, whatever um, districts. And the reason we don't talk about pre-K is because even if a district operates a pre-K, it's required to pay tuition. 
So it just becomes it becomes very difficult to know how to deal with categorizing. So just for simplicity, we talk about K-12. Um, but we can get you information about pre-K if that's something that, that you'd like information about. The next thing I'll give you, and this we won't spend any time on because it's basically the same. This is just a map of, um, of the current uh, of the, the document that you have there. Could you, know, could you pass that to Jane too? Thank you. So this is this is just uh, you know so that you can see as a map that list of districts that um, that I gave you before. Did I give you the right one? Yes, I did. Okay. So um, all of the orangey ones are the new unified union school districts that were created by voter approval under one of the programs that the legislature um, enacted. Um, the others that are various colors, yellow and, and pink and blue, these are all of the districts that did not um, uh, voluntarily um, uh, pursue that path. Um, and it gives, um, it, it, again, it gives, e even in voluntary merged districts, newly created districts, it again gives the identification of what, what grades are tuitioned, if any are tuitioned in that district. One thing I will point out is um, you'll find that in, on this map there are five uh, districts that are polka dots, and you'll see one way over on the um, western side of the state about halfway down, and the polka dots indicate the um, the, what I was talking about with the MUDs before, they are a member of the Union School District only for the high school grades, and they retained their own um, district for the elementary school grades. So it was just a different way of identifying them. Is this map the same as that map? Uh, no, it's not. Yeah, different map. That's a different map, and I'll get that one in okay. a minute. <laughs> So this, this gives you only the results of what happened after districts took advantage of the various voluntary programs that the legislature created. It says here, uh, voter approved merger activities is kind of how you can tell. But it says as of July 1st. It says of J July 1, 2019. The reason is because if you see on there, you'll see that some of them don't become um, operational until then. They've already been created, and we th felt like it was more helpful to know what it's going to look like rather than what it looks like this year, which is a transitional year. Um, so the next, to some degree concurrently, but more at the very end of these voluntary phases, the next thing that Act 46 did was um, said any district that is has not created one of these um, uh, districts that is eligible for um, uh, the tax rate reductions and a few other districts, and I'll, and I'll talk about that a little, a little bit more in a minute, but except for a certain group of districts, any district that hasn't gone forward with a merger um, is required to do three things before, and it turned, it, the timing got changed, it ended up being before, um, it's December um, 26th of last year, but um, and those three things were they had th those districts that hadn't voluntarily merged needed to talk with the other districts in um, their region. They had to self-evaluate how they were doing on their own currently, um, and they also had to present a proposal to the state board going forward, either that they would. Um, you know, how they would change whatever they're currently doing so that it could be, um, it, it, it would be better able to meet the goals that the legislature had set in a more sustainable way. And that could be done by um, keeping the same governance structure but changing some of the things they did, uh, you know, recognizing that there were certain issues that were problematic and how are they addressing those. It could be entering into um, agreements with other districts to work together in certain ways. It could be merging with them in the future. You know, it, it was up to them to make that proposal. When that proposal um, was then made, um, there were two more steps, and I can talk about this in, in more detail if you'd like, but um, the next step was is that the Secretary um, of Education was required to review these proposals and review what was going on in the state 
and have conversations with the school boards about whatever their proposal was, and then to come up with a plan to, um, and, the, and the language is, I mean, it's kind of almost indelible at this point, um, is um, to merge districts where necessary to create sustainable structures capable of me meeting the, the goals of the act. So, I mean, that's, that is a little bit paraphrased, but that was it, that the, 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 the secretary was directed to come up with this plan that merged the districts where it was necessary to do it to, 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 to further the goals of the act. There were certain things um, that, oh, I'm sorry, then, and we will go on to this in a minute, but the, then the third phase of it was is that the state board would, would review the secretary's proposal, um, had the option of talking to um, any districts it chose to, and then it was required to come out with a, a, a plan that was considered an order, and, and the way that it was written is, is it said, shall issue its order merging districts where, again, where necessary. So there were these, th these three phases of the places that hadn't merged, most of the places that had merged, that was the self-evaluation, talk with your neighbors, come up with a proposal. There, the second part of it was the secretary reviews the proposals, reviews other information, and comes up with a, a plan. And then the third phase was is that the, um, the, the state board would review the plan and would um, had the ability to take testimony if it chose to, and then it had to issue um, its order. And the way that the language was was written in the um, in the law was is that the state board could um, could accept this, the secretary's proposal, or could make changes, or you know, or could come up with its own version. It was supposed to take that into account, but then go forward from there. So. I, I started to say that there were some districts that were w did not need to go through this. Um, and essentially, there are two, three, four, five types of districts that were not required to go through this last phase. And this is the types. Um, the first type um, were interstate school districts, where Act 46 explicitly exempted um, interstate school districts from going through this process of figuring out um, how they could change their governance or work with other districts better to to um, to move forward, and there are two interstate school districts. It also this, the second category it, it um, exempted from this this last phase were the regional career technical center districts. So I don't know where all of you come from, but some of you might be in places where there are actual districts as opposed to um, being part of a, of a high school district. And, and those three are listed there. Uh, the, the third category that the um, that was in Act 46 were those new union districts that were created. If they were eligible for tax rate reductions and other um, other transitional assistance, they'd already gone through that process of. Um, of self-evaluation and talking to other districts and coming up with a plan and coming to the state board, and so that that was already that was already taken care of by the process that they had gone through. Um, so and then it, so it said here it says please see the document that I just handed out for those. So that was where it stood in 2015. In 2017, the um, the legislature enacted Act 49 which then um, exempted some other districts from having to go through this final process. Um, one of them was um, it added a new exemption that a supervisory district, so that's a, a, a supervisory union that has only one district, um, that has at least 900 students did not have to go through this process. And so, and this was in 2017 that this was enacted, and that, that's the list there of the districts that were exempt under that category. The final way that um, uh, a district did not have to go through this process um, was through a three by one or two by two by one um, process um, that was also created in Act 49 of 2017. And I and I realized after the fact I said receiving exemption is a three by one. There's actually one here that's a two by two by one, but it's it's the same general idea. And it is that, that there was a new program created in. Um, in Act 49 in 2017 that said, if you're three districts and you can't quite make the requirements of, um, that, you know, for otherwise to be able to be eligible for the tax rate reductions, and you have another district near you that has a different structure, the four of you can come in together and the, th the three districts will be eligible for the tax rate reductions. The fourth one that's different will get um, early approval from the state board that the state board is not going to 
require it to change when the state board does a program, uh, does a plan in the future. And so the, the districts that were received those early exemptions from being considered by the state board were Alberg. Um, it, it came in with the three districts that formed the Champlain Islands Unified District. By doing this, the three Champlain Island districts were able to get tax rate reductions. And also by doing this, the Alberg School District was able to get early assurance that the state board was not going to change its structure, or not going to require it to merge, um, because the state board does not have the authority to change structure. Um, the, another one was the Ira School District, and then if you skip down, the Rutland Town School District. They came, there were two new districts near them that also created, that are now part of the greater Rutland SU. Um, Ira and Rutland Town came together with those two and said, we'd like early assurance that you're not going to merge us, and the state board provided that. Peachum came in with um, what is now the um, Caledonia Cooperative um, uh, unified Union School District, and by doing so, Peachum got that assurance it was not going to be merged, and those other three districts that formed Caledonia Cooperative were able to receive the tax rate reductions and other assistance. And then finally, Marlboro School District um, is, you know, is a similar situation. It came in with, um, with uh, merging districts in its area and, and was able to get that, um, that assurance that the state board would not change uh, not merge it with another uh, district and, and have it be a part of a larger governance structure. So those are the districts that are were off the table when the state board was looking at all of this. The next the next um, document. These are all of this is what happened to all of the districts that were subject to the final report and order that was um, issued by the. Um, so first, there were, um, the, and there will be more information about this in my final document, but this, this tells you about all of the districts. The first page is the state board merged 25 different districts, and these are in this first group, these, the, the merged districts are the ones that are in italics to create these 11 new, um, uh, excuse me, 25 to create one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's right. Yeah, excuse me, seven new unified union school districts. So these are pre K through 12 districts that the state board created by merging those districts that are parenthetically listed after each of them. Another group of districts that the state board dealt with was um, there were uh, four new um, uni union elementary school districts that it created. And again, these were by merging the, um, the parenthetical italicized districts following it. Um, they merged two districts into an existing um, Union School District. So M Montgomery and Sheldon are listed here. They were merged into the Northern Mountain Valley USD. And then final group of merged districts, uh, it conditionally merged Five dis those five districts were that were the elementary school districts involved in a mud, and the reason it was it was conditionally is because the, the mud itself was eligible to receive tax rate reductions and other transitional assistance. It could not be required to do anything by the state board, so it has to be vol voluntarily, you know, willing to accept these other dis these districts. The next two pages list by um, supervisory union, alphabetically by supervisory union. Those districts that the state board considered and said, no, you're right, the, the best, you know, it isn't best to um, require you to merge. And so these are the districts um, on, the, on pages two and three that um, retained their, their current governance structure and were not merged to form a lo larger union district. And in all of these situations, um, we've indicated, you know, whether there are K-8 operating, K-12 operating, you know, what, what, whatever their operating intuition and structure, again, using that same um, method of O and T. And then the map that you have up there right now is the one that shows the, what is the result of the state board managers. Um, the, the, the MUDs that have to approve those mergers, are those are votes of the towns or the districts in the MUD or just like the board? No, it's the, the voters of the entire MUD, including because, for example, um, for example, in Orwell, 
um, Orwell is a mud, or was part of a mud, for, for the high school grades. So it required a vote of everybody in the mud, including Orwell, even though Orwell was the subject of it. So it's the voters in the entire district voted for it. So this is basically the same as the previous one, except that instead of having the operating and tuitioning identified, in gray are all of the districts where the uh, State Board of Education required that there be mergers. Um, white are all of the places where it did not require it. Orange is the same as on your earlier map, but those were all of the places where the voters followed one of the um, um, programs. And actually, I should have said there were two asterisks in, you don't need to go back to it, I'll just point them out. In the second document I gave you, which was the voter approved, there were two asterisks. One is that um, uh, those places that were, became eligible for the tax rate reductions and other transitional assistance because it was the three or the two and a three by one or two by two by one. And the other is there were three districts that during the same period chose to voluntarily merge even though they were not eligible for tax rate reductions or um, other transitional assistance, and so those are identified by a different asterisk. So finally, and then, I'm sorry? Um, so I just, on my handout, what would be the first page of the school, or the State Board of Education created the mm -hmm. um, district? Are any of the, these districts satisfied with what some of the districts are, but it but it isn't necessary that like all of them are. All of them aren't within the district. So, for example, there might be a place where a new district was created and two of the merging districts are unsatisfied and are part of the lawsuit, and the other two are not. Or you know, and it can go in many directions. It can go so all of them are, or all of them are not, or you know, it's it's um. um it's a mixed bag. <laughs> so the final document in, um, is just bringing you up to date with all of the different numbers um, and the, the changes from the governance. Um, so in fiscal year 13, so this was prior to um, not prior to the enactment, but prior to anything happening actually with Acts 153, 156, or 46, um, there were 276 um, districts. Uh, prior to um, Act 46, because there had been a couple of mergers, there were 267. If you take all of the voter approved mergers under, under Act 153, 156, and 46, there are 154 districts compared to 276. Um, if you include the state board mergers, um, there are, it goes down to 120 districts. And if all of those potential um, mergers with the MUDs occur, there would be 116 districts as opposed to 276 districts. Um, and it gives information about the net um, reduction. Um, and also about changes in, in SUs. I'm not going to go through every bit of this because you can read it for yourselves. But um, I, I would. I just want to point out a couple of things about this. One is is that um, voter approved mergers. Um, since the enactment of Act 46, it was 151 districts located in 141 towns merged to form 38 new school districts. Um, there were seven merger proposals that the voters didn't approve. Um, and in, even in those places where the voters didn't approve it, voters in eight districts approved merger. Voters in 18 districts did not. Um, and also just to, to point out that there were um, there were several instances where newly merged districts were created. Um, there were eight merger proposals that were actually approved but um, one of the districts chose not to, 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 to merge, and so it is not merged. Um, on the second side, this is to give you some information about those, um, those proposals that I said would come from any of the districts that are not exempt from the State Board's plan. Um, 
it was all, it was, what they had to do was talked about in Section 9 of Act 46, so we always talked about them as Section 9 proposals. So there were 46 either districts or groups of districts um, that submitted an oral or written Section 9 proposal. If you, if you separated all of those districts and groups of districts out, there were 96 districts, and of those 96 districts, 11 of them were um, Union High School districts. Um, that, that represented 90 towns. Um, of those 46 proposals, so it could either be a, a district or a group of districts, and again, and this goes back to your question, there were situations where one district would ask for one thing and another district in the same you know, area would ask for something else and only one of those could come true. Um, so of those 46 proposals, nine proposed um, that the state board require merger, 30 proposed to retain the same governance structure, Three requested the opportunity to be able to go forward with either um, a proposed merger to their voters or to create an interstate school district. And four either made no real proposal or um, proposed something that the state board didn't have the authority to do, doesn't have legal authority to do. Um, then if you go to the, ne the last category here, um, the state board's final report and order. So it addressed all of these 96 districts by requiring 45 districts located in 39 towns to, to either form 11 new districts or enlarge existing districts. It conditionally required an additional four town and elementary districts to merge with the MUDs. And the reason it's only four rather than five here is because um, Slate Valley, which is the district that uh, of which Orwell is a, a partial member, had its vote before the state board issued um, the order and said, if the state board orders us to do this, do we accept, or orders Orwell to join us, do we accept it? So that got included within the merger. And then finally, it did not change the governance structure of 47 districts. So it's 45 that were merged, four that were conditionally merged, and um, 47 that were not merged. And I want to give one other piece of information that I didn't include, um, and that is, is that in, in um, fiscal year 18, so 27-2018 academic year, um, there were approximately 78,700 kindergarten through grade 12 students in the state. That was 78,700. If you add in the numbers that have, you know, have been in each of these phases, 36,752 of them which is about 46.7, live or will soon live in, a, in that first category that I told you about, of the voluntary mergers. If you add in the students that already live in supervisory districts, those were those eight or nine districts that this, the legislature decided in 2017 were large enough not to have to go through this process. Um, if you add that, there's another six, almost 16,500 additional students there. So if you add those two together, you come up with a 53,247 is what I have. Um, so it's a total of about 67.6% of the students. If you add in the additional students that are impacted by the state board's order, that's um, almost, uh, it's 10,000 and then almost 700. 10,694 additional students are impacted by the state board's order. That brings the total of of students who either live or will soon live in a unified union or union elementary um, school or union, yeah, union elementary school district to um, 63,941 students, which is 81% of um, the student population using K through 12 um, fiscal year 18 numbers. So I know that that's a lot, and I'm really happy to answer questions now or to come back at a later time to yeah, answer so questions. Let's take questions for Donna before we um, hear from the person. So to the extent that you have Donna, can you help me? Senator, first of all, Senator Kent. Of the, the Section 9 proposals, mm -hmm. so you, you list the, the 46 proposals and 30, you list that they proposed to retain the same governance structure. Was that the requirement? I mean, well, what do you mean? So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering why that's the bullet point, the governance structure. Could, could, was, the, was the question in Section 9 saying propose a new governance structure, so 
those that didn't get a bullet point? And, and was that, the, did they make no other uh, suggested changes? Did they just? Oh, no, the reason that's the bullet point is just because that's what the state board's order does or doesn't do. It either changes the governance structure or it doesn't change the governance structure. So this was just a way to be able to compare the two. That was, that was all. But they proposed other changes. So it's different than saying in, don't do anything. Like in most, in most situations, yeah. Okay. Um, at what point will we see results, you know, from some of these districts that merged, especially the ones that took place in 2017? Are we, are we saving money? Are we getting better outcomes? We're, um, we're, starting, to see, we're starting to get um, uh, information mostly anecdotally at this point, and w one of the things that we need to turn to right now is determining what sorts of data needs to be collected and can be collected. Um, some of the things that we have seen, and, and uh, there are a few examples that were given in our report to the legislature from last January, so you, you might want to take a peek at that, um, were um, for the first time um, all of the districts uh, had a single facilities manager, and even though there was an additional cost of having that facilities manager, what they saved in other instances allowed them to have librarians and um, and are in school in elementary schools that had previously had it. So there's 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 some um, some again anecdotal evidence of those you know those kinds of changes being made. But I don't have any hard evidence of anything. And part of the part of what's difficult, and this is part of what we've been struggling with, is when you said hard data about how much is being saved. It's difficult to know when money is being repurposed. Because uh, many of these districts that did go forward with this told, you know, in, in their self-analysis before they came to the state board with their merger proposals, said we've had to cut these particular, you know, uh, programs. Um, and so if money is freed up, it might be that it's put back into, to, you know, expanding those programs or putting those programs back in rather than actually saving anything for the voters. So it's it's... So uh, that was a very long answer for um, we don't have anything. We're struggling with to how to figure out what to include. Our report to the legislature for this um, year uh, will include additional um, you know, information that we can get from some of the districts I, that have been up and running for a I while. I will say that uh, last year budgets came in well under inflation. Brad James, um, it's his considered opinion that that had a good deal to do with Act 46. If that's the case, we should see a similar effect this year. So I didn't put much stock in one year's result, but it, it was the right result if the trend is going to be the way we hope it will be. So, um, and Brad is definitely the person who will be able to talk to you about those financial issues. Another question, I guess, that if, if we haven't figured out the variables to measure, how, do we, how does the agency define success with Act 46? Does it, is it with just less school districts? Is it with, um, I was here as my freshman year, I was in the house, um, and it was very clear this was a cost savings measure, and um, and, and that public sentiment is, is or the, the march out of um, the agency has been changed in a few years. How do we, how do we address, how do you, the work folks that gotta go home and talk to our constituents, how do we say, yeah, this was a successful law, it wasn't a successful law. How, how do we define that? Well, the um, Act 46 identified several different goals, and actually the first ones that I had identified were educational opportunities, and then it was transparency, and then it was financial savings. Um, so I think all of those things are important to look at. And I think that we're going to have to look at all of those things, and I don't, I don't know um, because a lot of it is comparing what a particular district or group of districts was able to do before to what it was doing afterwards, and so it's going. Some of it is going to need to be anecdotal in that way that you know, there are more opportunities now in this particular region, um, and I don't really have a good answer for you at this point. And I, I'm sorry. I believe Kristen may have more uh, information, at least from the state board perspective about what opportunities have been, and, and again, this wouldn't be systematic data, but in terms of contact with um, voluntary mergers that have enough experience with the adult now and now. That's, that's one more question. Um, and, and just to kind of point to one, transparency, um, it seems to me that um, 
how are we going to measure that one? One, one thing, one way that it, it, it can be, and I know, that, I know that people have very different opinions about whether there is more transparency or less transparency, but one area where there is more transparency is, is that when you have an, a supervisory union that's responsible for a number of member districts, the supervisory union is currently has become increasingly more responsible and is currently responsible for a very large percentage of what goes on, uh, of the cost of what goes on in um, and among all of the districts. For example, it is responsible for providing for um, uh, uh, special education uh, uh, services. And that's pr probably where it comes, is the biggest. When a supervisory union puts together a budget, it puts together the bu budget of what it needs. It then is allocated to each of the districts. And if the voters vote their budget down, they don't have the ability in a district, they don't have the ability to change what that supervisory union allocation is. So there, was a, there were very large chunks of money in supervisory unions that are going out to the voters, and the voters have no ability to change them. Um, so one of the things that, one of the ways that this does create more transparency is, is that's just one light I, line item. If you have a single large district that is its own supervisory union, there isn't a separate, separate supervisory union budget. It is the district's budget. So in those places that have merged, one of the ways that there is tra more transparency is that what is being sent on, spent on special ed is one of the items that can be changed if, if the voters vote budget now. Um, there, are, there are other ways that people, and I'm sure that when people come in and talk to you, they will tell you why they do not believe it's, that there is as much transparency. And there, I know that people have expressed concern that they no longer will have um, you, you know, the, the, the meeting occurring in their own school, in their own town, that they can go to on a regular basis and talk to those people who are their neighbors. They, you know, those neighbors will be now part of a larger district, and so I know that there's some concern um, among some people that there is less transparency, and I'm sure that you'll you know, be hearing from that as well. Other questions for Donna? And by the way, we, we won't be taking questions from the audience. When I say questions, uh, I mean from Senate. Yeah. Um, of the Section 9 proposals, I know you have this note here. This is the part that I'm trying to learn on more about the stuff that I don't kind of follow how that all happens. So were any of the Section 9 proposals approved or accepted? Um, that isn't the way the, le the, the legislation was written. The, legislature, the legislation was written as that they would make these proposals, the secretary would review them and come up with a proposal herself, and then that proposal would be reviewed by the state board and it would come up with it. And it had the op option, but it didn't need to talk to the locals. So it wasn't, unlike a, um, a, a merger proposal, there wasn't a yes, the, the state board approves it, or no, the state board doesn't approve it. There was never that part worked into the process. It was part of the information that was given along the proposal, so, I mean, along the path. So the answer is no, because they didn't approve or disapprove any. Um, in reality, um, of the... Um, you know, of those places that weren't changed, they, you know, t to some degree accepted their proposal. They at the very least accepted their proposal that they didn't want to become part of a larger district. Um, and so that, you know, that that was what the state board was charged with was was where do we need to change district governance in order to meet these um, yeah. goals. I, I that think was what they were given. They they were given the opportunity in section nine to make a case not to be merged. And, and 47 of them were successful in their case not to be merged. But Donna's right, there is a semantic distinction about whether their proposal was approved or not approved. It was, it was um, in, in effect, approved because they were allowed to remain uh, as they were with a plan for um, changing other things besides the government solution. Um, and to follow up on that, so was there another part of the process that we could put in here of the of when the secretary had so that the proposals were really made to the secretary, right? And then uh, the se secretary made a proposal to the board. Yeah, and because that because because those were because that was just a proposal, I didn't include it, but I could give you that information. Um, and 
there, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have it with me, but um, there were a certain number that the State Board did not agree with, with the Secretary's proposals, either that the State Board said yes, we, uh, the Secretary said yes, you should merge them, and the State Board said no. Um, there were some, the State Board said we don't think you should merge them, and the State Board said yes, we, we do. And there were a number that the Secretary said no, and the State Board agreed. There were some that the Secretary said merge, and the State Board agreed. Um, for the most part, I think it agreed with most of the yes mergers and no mergers, uh, but there was a fairly significant group that they did not agree with one way or the other. Both yeah, and I, and I have those numbers if it's something that you need to, to track for you. And can you clarify what you just said about the 45 towns that didn't really get approved but got, but got approved? I well, don't understand. In, in other words, it wasn't that the state board uh, had a process for approving. That was information that would theoretically convince the state board not to merge them mm -hmm. or change their governance structure. So those uh, at the end there, the 47 districts whose governance structures were not changed were successful in their plea not to be merged. Um, it wasn't that the board said, we, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kristen, we, we have approved this. It was more like a, um, they added to the, to the discussion on the board in a successful way by getting their desired outcome, which was not to be approved. And some of those 47 were like the four that didn't even propose. They just said, we don't know what to do. I don't like it. No. I, um, there were some that didn't propose because their current board could not reach consensus on what to propose. Right. I can think of at least one of those where the state board did require them to merge. Um, another place where they asked for something that couldn't be done, they were not merged. So I think it, again, it's so like I think it in my district, Twin Field District, like they didn't. They, they tried to vote, they didn't vote, so then they just didn't do anything. So I thought they were one of the four that No, they they said that they would like to, um, I believe that they were not considered one of the ones that was a four. They, okay. they, they actually said that they could they were foresee yeah. that, be, that merger yeah. would be beneficial to them, and that was the information that was presented. So that goes to your nine proposed that SB require a merger? I would have to look okay. at the numbers, but I believe so. But that's the kind of thing that you heard from some, like, we're open to you figuring it out because we couldn't get come to a conclusion with that. Right. And but. there were some situations like, um, I, 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 um, there, there was one that I can think of where I believe two of the districts weren't able to, no, two of the districts said, yes, please merge us. One of the districts said, no, definitely don't merge us. And, a, and the fourth district wasn't able to reach consensus, I believe. That was the way it sugared off. It might have been that two didn't reach consensus and it was one and one. And the state board came up with a plan that, you know, it couldn't make everybody happy, so it came up with a plan that did something. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much, Donna. You're very welcome. Um, if you want to switch seats, or, or if sure. you have to leave, Donna. Uh, no, I'm not anywhere until 3.30. Okay. Um, so welcome, Krista. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, right Krista Hewling is... Um, Chair of the State Board and um, has been in that role for two years. Two years now. And um, I also want to acknowledge yeah. Peter Pell in, in the room. Do you need a seat? Yeah. Um, it's oh. do, you want, do you want to sit? No. Are you sure? Are you okay? sure? <laughs> well, this is not pretty out of heat, so. Do you want to sit here? Well, what are you going to do? I'll just stand over to the side. It's fine. Yeah. Come on. Donna? Why don't you come? Okay. Um, so, uh, Donna moved from Ledge Council to AOE. Peter moved from the House to uh, the State Board and is part of the institutional memory of um, how things got where they are. Um, and, uh, so, welcome to you both. Feel free to present however you Life. Yeah, I mean, first I'd just like to introduce myself and, and thank you for having me. Um, for some of you, I'm just meeting you for the first time, um, and some have been here for a while. Um, and uh, so I'm Krista Hewling. I live in Cambridge. I also am a teacher in South Burlington, so that's why I was teaching this morning and, and came up here right after classes and trying to find parking. It was a little difficult, so thank you. Um, for, for and thank you, Donna, for coming in and, and being first to go. Um, and so I just want to... Um, Welcome and, and looking forward for two years of coming and working together. And then, Peter, um, you really uh, said. You, you want my brief bio? I've been on school boards elementary, 
Union High School Tech Center. I was on the Board of Trustees of the State Colleges, and uh, now I'm on, I was eight years in the House Ed, and now I'm on the State Board of Ed. Um, so thank you for having us in. And, um, and we can just really get started with the, the process and, and how we went forward. And so Donna went over so much information there. This right here is a memo that the State Board put out in July. And this memo... Uh, am I looking with uh, So in this memo, uh, it just goes over... It was issued in July... Yes, we can give it over the end, too. So just when we looked at our charge, uh, just like everybody else on June 1st, we got to see the, the state plan. And so we weren't, we weren't given any sort of preview to that plan. And so just as it went up at 6 o'clock at night, that's when all the board members went on. We were looking for the plan itself. We then had a special meeting just to go over the overview of what was in that plan, and that was in early June. And later that month in June, we had our annual retreat. And at the annual retreat, we were able to sit back. And at this point, we had gone through and looked at the plan and, and figure out how did we want to move forward. And so the first thing that we did is we looked at what was required of us in Section 10. So you heard a lot about Section 9, and Section 10 is, is really where the State Board comes in. And we were charged with review and analyze the Secretary's proposal. Um, we're also um, given the charge of approving the proposal either in its original form or its amended form that adheres to provisions of the subsections. Or, um, and the last one is to publish on the agency's website its our order merging and realigning districts when necessary. And so this, we were um, issued in July, and we had the deadline of November 30th. So we're looking at, oh, how do we do this in a way that would um, be a successful way of trying to analyze and go through the Secretary's plan? The first thing, um, when we look at Section 10, it authorizes does not require the State Board to take testimony or ask for additional information from districts and supervised reunions. So that was not included. So this is what um, this is very much in the contrast of what's required of the secretary, and when the secretary is required for the opportunity to be heard from each study committee. Um, but we decided that we, um, even though it said we didn't need to take additional information from districts and supervisory, supervisory unions, we decided that this was something that we have to do, um, and that we gave ourselves that task of making sure that we gave everybody an opportunity to come to the state board and to have their, their say. And so this was a, a challenge looking at a board that meets once a month. Um, so we were not given any additional resources to complete this task, and we had from June until November to get it done. And so we looked and took a step back and said, what was the best way to do this? We decided to have three meetings, so July, August, and September, that we traveled around the state, um, again, in an effort to try to get closer. Not that we got into every geographic region, but we decided to do north, south, and central in, in an attempt just to, to get... Um, to these different areas. So we moved our board meetings into those areas. And at that time, we decided not to do anything other than look at this plan. Um, so we pushed off every other piece of business, um, really, and we're still just getting caught up right now in all the things that we had to delay in order to do that. And we, we had meetings that were between eight and nine hours long, um, going and taking testimony. So to do that, we, we invited, we divided the state into different regions and invited everybody to come. And yes, it was 20 minutes. I know that wasn't a satisfactory, satisfactory number for a lot of people, but it's a way that we could have everybody come in and still have it be manageable. In 20 minutes, when we asked the different areas to come in and talk, um, 10 minutes really about, we had already had the Secretary's plan, we had the Section 9 proposals, we asked for additional information from everybody before we got there about why it was not practical or practical practical or possible, um, which we said many times, um, and why the Secretary's plan and reacting to that. So we got that information and we gave them the 10 minutes and then allowed 10 minutes for questions. And to prepare for those meetings, we not only had the Secretary's report, um, we did go through the Section 9 proposals and use that as a background for uh, people as we're going and asking questions. And so we would spend a day listening and taking testimony, and we would also leave time for public comment, which many people in the room here today um, were there for public comment. And so we invited everybody in to, to make sure they had their say. Um, we always went over with public comment, and we still maintained, we still allowed people to come in. In addition, we also took a lot of public comment on, in writing um, through email from a lot of uh, people from the outside. So we, um, the State Board then took these meetings um, and we spent really 
three months listening and reviewing the plan and, and going through. And starting in October, we knew that we need to have some extra meetings just to try to go through um, more. So we had three meetings in the month of October. So we had the July, August, September meetings. In October, we decided we needed more time. So we spent one meeting just going over all the information that we had heard and trying to um, think about where we're going to make principles and how we're going to make these decisions as a board. And we did this all, again, in open meeting. This is all you know, in public, figuring out what is our process going to be. And so we did that. And at first, we tried to come up with this idea of do we have guiding principles? And then we kept going back to, well, guiding principles is the law. And what does the law say? And what does the law direct us to do? And so we spent more time just looking at the law and really um, trying to take what the will of the legislation was and, and put that into our decision making. And then we decided to, um, once we took a one meeting, again, an eight hour meeting, going through and looking at the law and the principles and, and where we're gonna go and move forward, the next two following meetings we decided to take um, uh, sort of a, a vote on whether or not to agree with the secretary or not. And we then pushed that if we agreed to the state plan. And if we didn't agree with the secretary, then we would have to come back with our mm -hmm. own decision. So we went one by one through all the decision points and deciding whether or not that they should be included or not. Um, and again, when we reached a point where there's one that we disagreed with the secretary, most often it got pushed to the next meeting and then we had some sort of proposal and sometimes we had a proposal at that meeting itself. So that different. And then at the very end, um, we came together and took a final vote on all the votes that we had taken in and that's what that makes up the, encompasses the state plan that we submitted to you as a legislature. And so that was our, um, our, our process moving forward. And we, again, put everything else to the side and just focused on this. Um, and right now, we have not taken up anything um, post 46 about this. Um, we've tried to move on into these other areas that we've been working on and, um, and get prepared for I'll just add a couple of things. Well, yeah. When we were doing the regional meetings, you assigned the board members to, to sort of focus on, on districts so that we, we were all coming in as as a team really focused on particular uh, uh, districts and their situations. The other thing, we spent quite a bit of time doing this process on small school metrics, and uh, that was a sort of a bump in the road that... Uh, <laughs> well, it was, it was interesting because um, we were writing a report that we're going to be discussing tomorrow at our meeting, and that we, have a, we owe the legislature a report about what we did last year, and it was really reacting to directives from the legislature. So we were directed to create small school metrics, and that was due by June 30th. So that's what we completed at our June retreat, um, and we've been working on the months up to that getting there. It was a little bit difficult because it directs us to use EQS, and there is no data collected by the agency just on EQS, so that's where um, it was not as easy as maybe intended. So that took a process, so that went up to June, and then we started with this, and that's been really encompassed our, our whole year has been answering directives that have been given to us by the legislature. Without additional Without additional resources, yes. And so we were able to get some legal counsel with some reclaimed funds, but we had no um, independent legal counsel. Um, so we, we didn't have access into independent legal counsel until October. Okay, thank you. Questions for um, either uh, Christopher or Peter? How much? Did the testimony? I was I was with the one in the Northeast Kingdom this summer. How much did you guys take that into account, and uh, how much weight did you put behind local community votes? I think, um, especially with the local, or first of all, the testimony, I found it extremely helpful um, because. I think all of us reacted. We all went through our own different phases of reacting to the report, to the secretary's report. And it really gave us different ways of looking at the report and different perspectives. And I know all of us kind of, we would feel one way and then go another. And, and I think we were really swayed um, by the public testimony. And um, as it comes to the local votes, we also struggled with that because the way the law is written, um, you saw with Donna, I think she did a really great job of showing you what was excluded by the legislature, and that did not include any local votes and, and no votes. Um, so we, we did struggle with that, and in the end, we went back to the law and followed what we believe the law told us to do. And again, that was, um, 
that was difficult. And I think a lot of board members had to, you know, we, we all went through our own sort of journey with this piece of legislation, and we did spend so much time with this. And again, not only just the board meetings, but preparing for all the board meetings and reading the report over and over and going back to the law. And I think that was the most interesting process, was you would be reading the secretary's plan, you get some public comment, you go back to the law, and you're like, well, what does the law really say? And you go back. So I, I just found over and over we're returning to the actual legislation, and not just in 46, but in 49, and, and looking for what was what was written down and given to us as directives. And if I could, if I could just add a little yeah. color commentary. So I've been in this room for the last eight plus years, and every year we've been working on one of these things, Act 153, Act 156, or Act 46. I will say no piece of that had more intentional thought and discussion than the end game of Act 46. So the fact that it moved from the legislature to the governor's signature to the agency to the state board, we settled on that after months of considering other ways to do it and should this be the final piece, should it come back to the legislature, should this happen? So love it or hate it, um, it was not an accident the way it's written. It was it was very deliberate. Um, so I'm, I, for one, I'm glad to hear that the board was um, returning to the to the actual legislation uh, as much as it did. Do you want to say something? I just want to say that uh, I, I think this for the board members was a transformative event. I mean, this we really coalesced. There was no politics. There was nothing, and it was this was this is this is serious stuff. This was tough stuff, and uh, we we really spent a lot of time in deliberation. And, and I think it, it, in terms of the group, we really. Uh, um, I'm not sure I've ever been on a board to see see some people come together and, and, be, and be so forthright and, and, and uh, inclusive and uh, you know and thoughtful and, and researched. I mean, it was. Uh, I don't know if you want to say, but I, I, I as all of us, whether whatever your polit political affiliation, we really did work together as a as a as a, as a unit. And, uh, um, we didn't invite this, <laughs> you know, this <laughs> but uh, you know. Yes. Uh, remind us again of the composition of the of the state board. Um, how many people? What geographic areas are you from? What sure. are your backgrounds? Um, um, so it's interesting. Right now, there are two females on the board: myself and and Stacey Weinberger, who's from Burlington. Um, so Peter, uh, and so and I'm from Cambridge, up in Lamoille County. Um, so Peter. I'm from Woodbury. Maybe we might call the gateway to the Northeast Kingdom, but <laughs> close. And close. Um, we have a student member, Callahan Beck, who is in St. Johnsbury. Um, so Bill Mathis, and Bill Mathis is down in Goshen. Uh, we have Mark Perrin, who is from Middlebury. Um, we have um, Oliver Olson, who, what is it? Is it the Manchester area? London Dairy. Okay, London Dairy. Um, and then um, John O'Keefe, who's London Dairy. John Carroll, who is no, Norwood. John O'Keefe is Manchester. Isn't he? Oh, Manchester. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, sorry. They because they are in a similar area. And um, John Carroll is from Norwich. Norwich. Um, and we also have Kyle um, uh, Coutois, who is from um, the. Georgia up um, north area. So we have two board members that will be leaving, and that is Stacy and Mark. And so their last board meeting is February, so we'll have two more. Um, but that was the, the composition going in um, to the end. And we have two, just may I say, two student members. The, the junior goes in as non voting, and the, as, yeah. as in the second year is voting. These, these are very, these, they're active, they, they really contribute a lot to this, to the board. And actually, so um, our, our student member that was voting, Callahan, um, she was great about, she's like, oh, it's helping me keep my study skills up over the summer <laughs> and, and making sure doing the research. So it was really, um, I think everybody, as you said, we took assignments and going through and making sure every Section 9 proposal was read in depth by at least three board members um, and, and using that as our foundation that we would have uh, different people study different plans and within those plans that people would go and look at board minutes um, for what had happened at the local board. So not only because we were taking what people were coming and telling us, but then what were, what were we not hearing? And so we're doing our own research in that respect and looking at board minutes from those local areas. Um, so using all those sorts of resources. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I get back to your decision-making process? Can you talk us through um, the examples where the secretary, or just an example, 
how you made your decision where in a case where the secretary didn't recommend a merger, but you chose to merge those districts, um, that seems to be harder for you as a board to do than to look at a merger situation and then you know say, no, we don't agree that should be a merger. But to take something where the secretary said, nah, I, I think they have a good plan, but you guys chose to merge it. Can you just take us through that thought process? Yeah, and so and I, what I led you to that conclusion? Yeah, and so I, I can't go into specifics because, as you know, we're in, in the legal court case, but um, as it comes to our decision process, um, I, I think it was as we're going through, we're looking for our consistency to within the plan itself and, and, and how is this, how we're, how we're coming to decisions. And if we got to an area and we're just, we didn't, we would first take a vote whether we agreed with the secretary or not. And so that was sort of the initial, okay, if we're reading this, does this fit into the rest of the plan? Does it make sense with the local information? And if we disagreed, then we went down another path. So we, we took the vote, and then we would look for a different solution. And so with that, I think there are numerous factors, and it really does depend on the local, what was going on. But it wasn't just a one-size-fit-all. We really tried to look at various different factors. Is your your final report out yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So November 30th, yeah, it was, okay. it was okay. online. So that was and part of our requirement. It's published on the agency's website, um, and, and that that is um, online. And was it a unanimous vote for the final plan? It wasn't. And um, I think that speaks to the strength of the plan, um, is that we, as Peter alluded to, we, we all, you know, every single decision point, people felt very differently, and some agreed and some didn't agree, and um, and it wasn't unanimous, and most decisions were not, and it was not just one or two people that always were on the outside. It was it was always a mix, and so to me that spoke to the that everybody was really trying to look at the case itself, um, and as Peter alluded to, right now, currently with the the makeup of the board, we have conservative to liberal to very moderate in between, and. We had people that were, um, it was not a political decision. It was really <coughs> trying to do to the facts. Is there a um, so this is a, this is a basic question. So the secretary had a plan. Is yours also called a plan, or yours is a report of the secretary's plan, or what's this the terminology? The, the, uh, is it the? Yours is the final it's order. It's a final, final order, order, but it came the out. Final report and order is I think what you call yeah. it. <laughs> report and order. Yeah. Yeah. If you look behind you on the laminated map. Yeah, the final order. order. But it's in a report, which is yes. more <laughs> <laughs> And if a town that had a Section 9 proposal wished to read that final order report, did they, would they get an answer or like an explanation of why their proposal was or wasn't, because wasn't, it wasn't accepted or changed, or like in Senator Perry's, you know, that, that kind of? No, that's a good question. In the final order, we really reacted to the Secretary's plan, because that's what we were directed to do under legislation. So we were directed, so if you're going back to the lettering, that we needed to review and analyze the Secretary's plan and either approve it, its original form, or amend it. So we really tried to work from the Secretary's plan and, and, and react to that. And the report includes the analysis. Yes, yeah, and so, and really. Analysis, okay. In other words, what, what, rather than deliver it to each um, group that submitted a Section 9 plan, it's all available there, but it's speaking deliberately to their situations in each and, case. And the Secretary's report in general does a lot of analysis of the Section 9 plans too, so in some places we react to some of that analysis. So that's where I can't say, yes, we reacted to every single one. Um, but again, since we were reacting to the Secretary's plan and, and there was a lot of Section 9 proposals analyzed within that plan, there are some reactions, direct reactions to those. So do you think if a town had a proposal and they read either, either just your plan and, or report in order in the Secretary's plan, they would get a, they would feel like their proposal was responded to, that they would understand why it either was changed or not changed or what part of their plans kind of went somewhere I, and one person didn't or I would never want to say that like tell somebody how they should feel like I think but I think that's um but do you feel like that's in there that, that kind of information I feel like a lot of it isn't because it, within the secretary's plan itself the secretary spent time going through and in, there was a section nine including some analysis of that and also doing a highlights for the uh, and Donnie you can speak to that to see the appendix section and, and going through and, and highlighting what was in that section nine proposal I don't think every area would agree that the secretary maybe captured that, and so that's why I would never. Right. Sure. 
try to say how people felt. I can tell you that, that the append there were two particular appendices to the secretary's proposal because all of the the um, the, sec the section nine proposals that came forward were responding to the the goals that the, that the legislature had laid out and um, were giving the kinds of information that the state board had come up with with metrics or rules for what kinds of things might show some of some of their um, their ability to, to to meet the goals or not but every single report section excuse me every single section nine proposal that came to the secretary was different in the way that it was formatted and what it focused on and there, there were some that were two pages, there were some that were literally four binders, but it didn't necessarily mean that because it was large it was more thorough in its analysis. So what we did was we had two, um, two appendices at the back of the Secretary's um, proposal, one of which took each of those goals and copied and pasted from their proposals how they planned or how they said that they were meeting it or what they were planning to do to change it so that it would be possible to look at a, you know, a four-page document rather than a 700-page document that was set up in the same way for each district and, and try to you know, say, okay, how did they respond to this? The second thing we did was um, Brad James, our finance person, um, came up with certain uh, data points that were identical, that were pulled off you know, from the identical sources for each for each proposal because one of the other things we found is that some people would talk about ADM, some people would talk about enrollment, some people would talk about pre-K, some people wouldn't. And so we wanted to be able to have numbers that were you know, apples to apples and it could be compared. So, um, but you know, both of those things are resources at the back of the Secretary's proposal. Okay. Um, just to follow up on Senator Hardy's question, um, could you let us know what, for the record what the vote was? Uh, oh, we have two dissenting. And, and how many total? What? Uh, there was eight, so six, four, and two against. And as a, sec as a chair, I don't vote. I only vote um, if there is a tie. I need to break it. So there are nine voting members on the board. Well, thank you both thank you. very much, and Donna as well. Um, as you can tell from the from the attendance today, it remains an issue that um, is going through that long process. It's now move to a different venue. Um, but speaking for myself, you guys took an amazingly difficult task, and I think you approached it with exactly the right um, seriousness. And you, I think, actuated the law that we wrote. Whether or not the courts agree that uh, it's legal the way it's written, that's a somewhat separate issue. But I think you kept faith with what the legislature asked of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, folks, we have uh, Nicole Mason, Jeff Fannin coming in at three. I'll suggest we take a 15-minute break and allow the people who were here for Act 46 to um, go elsewhere if they like, and then we'll reconvene the break. Okay, so um, for new members on the committee, we, we have a phrase that we say in here, which is the usual suspects. <laughs> it's the NEA, the VSBA, the Principals Association, and the Superintendents. So Nicole Mace is, I believe, the first one of the usual suspects that you have. But that it's Madam Mayor now. <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah, actually, until January 28th. Oh. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. You're hoping you'll be able to agree for that. That's right. That's right. I'll, then I'm going to carry my gavel. <laughs> yeah. But in other words, every it's piece of legislation moment in time that we so take we have these four groups' opinion, and uh, and they usually help us revise, write whatever we plan. Well, thank you well, for inviting uh, me to be one of the first usual suspects um, before your committee. Because it's the first time I'm here, I thought I'd spend a little time, especially for newer members orienting you to the organization and who we are, who we serve, and how we take positions um, that we will then share with you at different points of time throughout the session. Um, so the VSBA has been, is a 501c3. Um, we've been uh, in existence since uh, the early 1960s. Um, 
the vision and mission of the organization have evolved over time, and you can see it all there. I'm not going to read this to you, but in a nutshell, the VSBA is a membership organization. Um, much of our revenue comes from dues that are paid by member school districts. Our mission is to support school board members in the performance of their role. It's a difficult um, job that requires uh, a lot of technical knowledge, um, but also a lot of more sort of counseling and support over the phone about how do you balance a lot of the competing interests that come before you as a school board member when you've got big decisions to make that impact your community's children and taxpayers. Um, so we spend a lot of time doing that work, um, um, but we also serve as their collective voice in the public policy environment. Um, and I always need to remind folks that um, not all school board members see every issue the same way. So while we endeavor to represent the perspectives of school board members and school boards, and we have clear processes um, within the organization for taking positions, it's not out of the ordinary for you to hear from a school board member in your district that has a different point of view and perspective. And that's, I think, largely because of the context for school districts uh, around the state vary significantly, both in the economic um, makeup and the size and the geography um, to the um, traditions and community values that are reflected within the school system. So um, we do our best to reach out to members and ensure that our positions are informed by those diverse perspectives um, and always welcome our members to share their own views with policymakers as you're um, grappling with a difficult issue. The organization itself is a board of 24 school board members. Um, there's a president and an immediate past president and then 22 regional representatives. So we're organized in 11 regions and two uh, representatives from each region are elected um, from that region to serve the board. The board meets once a month um, and uh, the current president is Clarence Haynes from Middletown Springs, which is in the Rutland um, region. We're governed by bylaws, resolutions, and policies. So resolutions are positions that are taken by the association on issues of importance to school board members and school boards. Um, they include recommendations for action within the policy environment, but also for our own organization to, you know, we're, we're, we have a resolution to look at our regions. Now that we have Act 46 has created a bunch of new districts, some of our regions don't make sense. So it both gives us work to do internally, but also guides our work externally. Um, and they are, these resolutions are approved at the annual business meeting every October. In the absence of a resolution, I go to the board, um, so it's not unusual for something to pop up out of nowhere and we don't happen to have a resolution on it. Um, the board gives guidance to me uh, and the rest of the staff. We have four full-time staff who um, deliver uh, our services to our members. So that's background on our organization. With respect to statewide bargaining, uh, in 2017, um, the reason I wanted to talk with you a bit about our resolutions process, uh, our members approved a resolution, um, and there's some whereases in background and sort of why they um, support this, but, but uh, in the end of the day, uh, they called for the General Assembly to adopt a process for the negotiation of health care benefits at the state level by a council of school board members to apply to contracts that expire in 2019. So that was the, the resolution bringing us into last legislative session um, where we worked with um, the Vermont NEA and this committee primarily uh, to draft a language that was ultimately um, incorporated into Act 11. I have a couple of newsletters. Um, this is from the fall of 2018 and has a pretty detailed overview of the process for statewide bargaining. So um, it's important that our members understand, but thought it might also be a good educational resource for um, members of the committee to, um, to review. Um, it is um, a complex piece of uh, legislation and clearly groundbreaking uh, for the state of Vermont and for school boards. Uh, certainly puts the VSBA in a role that it has not historically played. So we have not um, 
historically represented school districts at the bargaining table in collective bargaining um, uh, with the representatives of employees. So this is brand new territory for us um, as an association. We've provided trainings and workshops, et cetera, but we've never um, been responsible for being at the table. Um, so because Act 11 uh, creates this official role for our organization um, in support of statewide bargaining, it was important to us and to the board to put our processes before the membership for their approval before we embarked on this um, in terms of appointing our representatives and developing a ratification process. So um, we spent time over the summer developing some additional criteria that we might want to include uh, in terms of um, appointing representatives to the bargaining commission. Um, and we also um, developed a ratification process, which the, the law requires us to do. And in October, the members approved both of those processes. So we were really unable to appoint our members to the bargaining commission until November when the board met. We had an open application process. Um, and uh, at their November board meeting, the VSBA board um, appointed their members. So that's what the second newsletter is for. <laughs> um, uh, I believe it's on page 10, your Act 11 Bargaining Commission members. Um, and you can see a little bit about where they're from and what their background is, um, pages 10 and 11. That article includes the statutory requirements and then the additional criteria that our members felt were important, really making sure we had regional representation among the five members, that we um, have people who have had experience negotiating and have uh, demonstrated a willingness to participate in professional development um, regarding negotiations. So in addition to the statutory requirements, um, these five individuals satisfy all of the above. Um, so the ratification process that was approved by the members is pretty, um, it's al uh, sometimes I worry that's almost too basic, but <laughs> um, uh, our organizational structure has our members um, at the supervisory union or supervisory district level. Um, and so every supervisory union or supervisory district has a vote uh, as part of the ratification process. And each SU or SD is required to submit their delegate information to us um, by April 1, which is when uh, bargaining is supposed to commence. Um, if the commission is able to enter into an agreement, um, then we have to host sort of an informational webinar for voting delegates to explain what's in the agreement and why, um, so that they have the information they need in order to cast their vote. And we have, we've given ourselves some flexibility on timelines in the event that we both want to provide people notice, but also not find ourselves in. We've now triggered arbitration because we didn't meet a deadline. So we have some flexibility in terms of being able to have that vote happen on a relatively timely basis. Our members are, we, we um, pioneered electronic voting at our annual meeting this fall, so we're building familiarity with that process among our members so it won't be a foreign um, experience. So logistically, um, we feel like we've put the pieces in place. Um, and I'll just conclude with um, some of the specific steps just to reiterate what's, what's transpired since June. Um, over the fall, we solicited input from our members regarding bargaining goals. So we have regional meetings with our membership every fall. Um, Secretary French joined us and spoke for a little while, and then we had sort of focus groups with our members around three key areas uh, where we needed input. Um, teacher, student, or teacher, staff, student ratio task force, um, statewide bargaining, and um, I believe 173, although there's more information in the newsletter if you, if you care to read that. Um, but anyway, in that process, we got information or, um, from our members around what they are looking for in terms of an agreement in this context. 
Uh, we approved the resolutions that I told you about. The board appointed their bargaining members. They've met twice now. They've been oriented to the law and to the process and the timelines. They're now in the process of starting to develop proposals. I've disassociated myself at this point from that process. They are represented by legal counsel. Um, so it's really, they're off and running and, and I'm, um, in fact, when I told them I was asked to testify, they wondered why I was doing that and, and why not their chair. I said, I'm just here to speak to what the VSBA has done in response to the law. If you want to hear from commission members um, directly, then I'll and refer my, you to the My thinking that. was as we came close to April, we would, like for instance, I asked Jeff uh, to come, uh, thinking that it was really the organization to hear from now and then we'll Right, right. Um, so the, the team's elected a chair uh, and spokesperson, legal counsel, as I said. And I think most um, the most exciting piece about all this is that Vermont and EA, I think we've been getting together on the, three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, um, you know, Jeff and I were uh, in this building at some point in June and um, <clears throat> talking to each other about the importance of um, working together to the extent we can, um, particularly around the collection of data around what exists currently uh, in terms of benefits. And so we um, started meeting in August, I believe. We had a meeting with business managers around, you know, what data do you have that we could use? What does the agency have? What does VHI have? Um, and identified a data set that we think is important to inform uh, this negotiation. We sort of went big uh, in terms of the ask because we didn't want to find ourselves a couple months into it and be like, oh, if only we had information about this. So it's a pretty um, uh, substantial request um, that we uh, shared with business managers in December. We, we went to a VASBO meeting and wasn't the warmest reception <laughs> because those folks are also in the process of putting together budgets. There's a lot going on with the statewide longitudinal data system that I'm sure you will hear about over the next couple of months, but there's been real challenges and strains <coughs> based on the business office. So we agreed to sort of delay our request so that it wasn't coming at a time when it would just be impossible to respond to. So. Um, the deadline for um, getting the, the data, um, the completed spreadsheets was last week, and we have, I think, about 70% um, have submitted their data, which given all the other stuff happening right now is pretty amazing. Um, so the upshot is both parties are going to have a shared data set. So we are spending our time <coughs> negotiating around you know, what to do about what the numbers say rather than our numbers say this, your numbers say that. So I think it's a really good... Um, you know, it bodes well uh, in terms of at least um, putting in place some of the fundamental pieces here to, to ensure the process um, uh, is proceeding lawfully and productively. Um, so Act 11 created a really clear timeline for the parties to negotiate this first statewide contract. Um, we think that was uh, very important uh, in order to ensure this process concludes so that local bargaining can, um, can proceed and not be sort of held up by what's happening at the state level. Um, under the law, bargaining has to commence by April 1. We expect the parties are going to meet before then. Um, we know representatives of the party are decided meeting later this week to talk about meeting locations, dates, ground rules, those sorts of things. Um, so given the preparations for bargaining that we've undertaken to date, I know Jeff and I have talked about, you know, should we be recommending changes to the process? We're asking for no changes to the process. I think they might have a couple of suggestions, but given where we are and the fact that um, you know we're in we're in active proposal development mode, if we start to make tweaks, even if it thinks it looks like a tweak, it can yep. have a really profound ripple effect. So our our request is um, let's see how it goes um, this okay. first time around. Understood. Can I ask you, does that apply to the date change? I know NEA had 
when the plans take effect. Yes. I do not view that as a process change. I view that as a technical. I mean that we well, would I'm we would either have to negotiate that because the the plans don't actually. You know, the plan year is January 1 to December 31st. So I think we could handle that um, through negotiations, but a, a, that type of a fix to clarify, I think what we heard from Beehive was, you know, make sure you're paying attention to that. Um, because you can't start people in new plans July 1. And what, uh, just for the committee, for people who weren't here, one of the hallmarks of this um, language was that it was unanimously approved by everybody in the room. Uh, we worked on it for about a month intensively. It came from a plan that NEA put out, uh, VSBA put out, and AFSME, and we melded them together. And we um, you know, spent a long time making sure everybody was on board. And at the end of the day, we had that agreement. That was key to passing it through the House without changes from the Senate. It was key to bringing AFSME on board because they originally were um, a little... Uh, Who's that? AFSME is the uh, union that represents some of the... Um, American uh, Federation of State yeah. County Municipal Employees. Yeah. yeah. And, and represents some of the employees in schools who are not teachers. Um, so uh, with that said, um, I want to be very careful if and when we make any tweaks to this, because I want them, to the extent possible, to be unanimously approved by both sides, because I prefer not to develop any feeling that uh, anyone's been disadvantaged. Right. And I think once the process gets underway, yeah. it becomes problematic if either side thinks that they have a route to the General Assembly to sort of get a course correction. Yeah. Um, I think if there's an issue that both sides mutually agree, wow, we didn't see this coming, yeah. um, that's one That's one thing, or that's a different thing altogether. So totally other topic. <laughs> okay. As I was leaping through your, uh, your newsletter, uh -oh. <laughs> I, I saw the poll quote, we strongly oppose any diversion of education fund dollars to programs not within the jurisdiction of public school district or supervisory yes. unions. So the December one letter, the e-commerce revenue right, being so proposed the, to put into early ed. Yeah, the, the, if folks haven't been paying attention, there's been an idea floated by the governor and by different secretaries um, that we might take um, sales tax on e-commerce, which we're always supposed to go to the ed fund, but we couldn't get them because Amazon wouldn't give us that money. Now we have an arrangement that allows us to collect uh, six or seven million dollars a year and the governor has proposed that we um, split that revenue stream higher ed and early ed um, but the, the obvious rub of that is that's money that is otherwise supposed to go to the ed fund to keep people's tax bills low so to the extent we divert we're creating problems elsewhere. So just a heads up to the committee that probably in the end game, this will be something that we deal with more, you know, that is the last month. So just get ready. I'm happy to come back and talk with you about <laughs> any topic okay. in the newsletter or otherwise. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, um, Second of the usual subject. Uh, Ouch. Jeff represents uh, NEA teachers in the state. You want to give us a little uh, sure. just a little uh, meet so and read about your organization? First off, thank you for having me. Welcome. I, I think I know just about everybody here, but um, I'm Jeff Van, the executive director of Vermont NEA. Um, and uh, as Nicole pointed out, we, we're here with fair degree of frequency because this education committee work is important and near and dear to our heart. So. Um, Pharmacy, me or Colin Robinson, our legislative director, or Don Tinney, our new president. Uh, Martha Allen was term limited out, our former president. Now we have Don Tinney, former teacher at BFA St. Albans, who I think somebody here knows. Yeah, right in class, but he's a teacher when I was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Long time teacher at BFA St. Albans. So, yes, uh, anyway, thank you. Produced us in the night. <laughs> <laughs> we oh. remind her of that. Oh, <laughs> 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 that works. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, like I say, we uh, thank you for having me here. 
Uh, I've got some written comments that I'll give to you later because I made some notes on them based on what Nicole said and, and response to some of your questions. And I'll try to answer those or any others that you have uh, going forward. Um, the Act 11 Healthcare Bargaining Commission was uh, something we actually came to willingly, uh, given some circumstances and some background that I'll go through, I think, briefly here that I think are important for the committee to understand a little bit. Um, uh, to start, uh, the background, and we got to passage, the passage of Act 11 is very necessary. Um, for two decades, Vermont EA, Labor and Management, VSBIT, which is the Vermont School Board's Insurance Trust, operated well and operated VHI, which is the Vermont Education and Health Initiative, that offered health insurance to all school employees. So that was operated for about two decades equally, uh, a shared you know, labor management trust, uh, and that went along well, and we purchased our health insurance from Blue Cross. Actually, we purchased health uh, administrative services from Blue Cross. VHI was self, is self-insured. Um, and then through some things that happened at the federal level, most notably the Affordable Care Act, the marketplace in which VHI found itself regulated, the small group market, went away. Um, and so DFR, the Department of Financial Regulation, said, hey, we need to regulate VHI. And they said, we're going to regulate you under the Intermunicipality Association. Um, and that, um, that regulation under DFR said you had to have a majority of school board members on the school board, so uh, on the on VHI. So we went from an equal number to 3-2, and soon thereafter in the fall of 2016, that was in 2014, in 2015, there was an effort to uh, terminate the plans that we had then, come up with new plans that had higher deductibles and were compatible with HRAs, health reimbursement arrangements, and the HSAs, health savings accounts, for all the school employees. So that was in 2015. And then in 2016, um, the folks on the board uh, reduced Vermont and EA's seat on the board to one. I was the one uh, in 2017, went forward, and there was four to one. And uh, so we, my members in the fall of 16, started to say, hey, we don't like what's happening here. And, so, and they, about 2,000 folks signed a petition saying, um, we need to change VHI to re return it to its balanced, you know, two decades of operation. <laughs> Uh, or find a different way to uh, dis make decisions, most notably consensus decision making, or uh, frankly start over and try to figure this out. That led us to where we were um, in 2018, which led us to think that there's a better way to do this. School boards had uh, tr proposed something the year before, and eventually we figured out uh, that there was a way to do this in a way that we thought was equally shared. Um, and as Nicole uh, Happily pointed out, we started, Nicole and I met and discussed, I think, for the first time in June while you were here, I think she's right, how do we start working together collaboratively, getting data that we all need and not arguing about it. And so we've been doing that and meeting regularly ever since over data. So, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, like, my, like Nicole, I am not on the bargaining commission. We have all teachers or support staff on the bargaining commission. Um, and I'll read through the names, you may some, know some of them. Uh, John Harris from Chittenden East, uh, Nora Skolnick from Randolph, Will Adams from up in Hazen area, Mike Campbell, uh, another BFA St. Albans person, I think he's our chair, Barb Griffin from Berkshire, uh, Lorian Darrell from Springfield, support staff person, Bill Douglas from Caledonia County, support staff person, and Larry O'Connor from Middlebury, uh, a teacher there. Those are, that's our bargaining team. Plus, there's an ask me seat at this table. Now, there, it's the, the commission is five five. That, the Act Eleven said five five. That's a lot more people than five. We're not ganging up on the other side. <laughs> um, we realized early on when we started talking with folks who might we solicited volunteers, and somebody volunteered and said she was interested in participating. And then the, almost the very next month, she said, "I can't." She had a family commitment or something like that. We realized that we wanted to have more people at the ready and able to step in. So we have four voting folks plus the AFSCME person, and then some non-voting people who, are, who will participate. So that in case one of the voting people has, has to step aside for whatever reason, life happens, somebody can slide right in and is ready to go, and it doesn't um, affect the bargaining. So everybody, because as Nicole pointed out, dates are going to be hard to start coming by, getting 10 people together, plus uh, 
we have Suzanne Durmeyer, our, our former elementary school teacher, who advises our group. Uh, they have, they've got Joe McNeil, an attorney in, in Burlington, getting mm -hmm. 12 or 13, whatever that is, people scheduled together is going to be tough. Jeff, can I just ask, you said you have these other people participating. To what, to what extent do you envision <clears throat> them participating at? They won't, they won't be making decisions. They won't be voting. They won't, they'll be, we'll be keeping them up to speed in some way or fashion. The answer is I don't entirely know, but the goal is to make sure that if somebody has to step aside, which happened in our thinking, right. you know. I'm thinking of alternate jurors, so they're not they're not in the jury box. Um, so if I am getting it right, you're going to have five and five at the table, and these people may be attending, or but, but uh, they wouldn't be. I know what, how I might think it might play out, but as yeah. Nicole pointed out, they're meeting this week for the very first yeah. time. Uh, it's actually just Mike Campbell and, and Barb Griffin and Suzanne Duramire are meeting with Joe McNeil just to set the table. Mm -hmm establish the rules. So I don't want to suggest for them what, how they should operate. Mm -hmm. Our thought is we need to make sure that we have people able to step in. So they need to be at least well yeah. versed in what's going on. I'm just thinking if uh, on a pragmatic basis, if one side comes in with twice as many individuals who are empowered to speak, it starts to be more like, a, you know, not our design to okay. uh, dominate the conversation by any stretch. And usually, yeah. what happens is there's a one spokesperson, uh, and I think that, and then you caucus and you can hear your differences or whatever, figure out what you want to say the next go around. And obviously, it's up to the two sides to figure out the, you know, the, the logistics of how the bargaining actually works. But um, when you said they'd be participating, it was right. One of the things that we, we found with the new health plans that. Um, that are in place now is, and I think is important for us, everybody here is to, to uh, appreciate, is the third party administrator situation. Um, you may have read about it in the news or otherwise. Um, the new health plans that we're operating now have a third party administrator administering the HSA or the HRA portion of the health, health plan. Um, that did not go well starting in January 1, almost immediately. One of the one of the plans, one of the providers uh, is a Vermont-based provider, third, uh, Future Planning, uh, and almost immediately after about two months of starting January one, when the new plans came online, by the first week of March, they decided they were pulling out of the business altogether. So that left a lot of people in the lurch, and they say, they transitioned to a new group called Data Path, which is picking up, but Future Planning had 80 percent of the school business in the state. And that's who they, it was a large chunk of the business. And almost within two months, they were deciding not to do this anymore at all. They got out entirely. So that's, this entire year has been um, a significant challenge for my members. Ultimately, it led to, we filed a lawsuit, the Burlington Education Association and some 30 other local associations around the state have filed a lawsuit um, trying to uh, seek damages for all of the, the prob problems that future planning is. Uh, weaknesses in administering the HSAs and HRAs led to. So that's that's a process that goes on. I don't think it's affected by you folks here, but you should be aware that that's out there. And it's a, a lawsuit that's that's rolling along. In fact, I think I saw an answer today to the lawsuit that was filed in December. Um, so that, that continues on. Um, and we may be seeking some, some help in that area, but it's unrelated to Act 11. Um, as I said, there's an ask me person on the board, on the bargaining commission. Um, uh, and as Nicole pointed out, they've got to start bargaining by honor before April 1. I'm not trying to be redundant here a little bit, um, but we're gonna try to meet before then and get this ball rolling. She, uh, Nicole suggested, and you, Senators, uh, I, the timeline, that, and what we're seeking, and we think is important, that came from VHI, is the start date for the new health plans would be January 1, 2021. And the reason we think that's, I think everybody thinks it's important, I think it's largely an agreement, uh, is because the IRS, the way they treat HRAs and HSAs, it's a taxable thing, so you want to start that January 1. And, and just as we transition into these plans and this new round of bargaining, 
we think we got to start on January 1. So I think we're all in agreement on that in large measure. And, and I think agree with Nicole, it's a technical change that, that doesn't affect bar bargaining whatsoever. Um, here's where we vary, perhaps. Um, we, we think there are two other technical changes that are important. Uh, one is under Act 11, um, if we can't reach agreement, and that's a big if, at the end of the process there's a, um, an arbitrator that both sides have agreed to use to um, issue a final and binding decision on the parties. Um, we, um, the, the arbitrator, as the law is currently written, can choose only one side or the other's position. Under CELRA, the State Employees Labor Relations Act, the, there the decision maker, same scenario, gets to pick one side or the others, or if it's going to lead to an unreasonable result or unreasonably alter the bargaining relationship between the parties, he or she could select um, the fact finder's report, which is, happens a couple of months before. So that doesn't even, that whole fact finding process doesn't begin until September. The arbitrator's process doesn't begin until November. So, um, as I understood Nicole's concerns yesterday when we chatted, the concern was changing the law, particularly once the parties were in the middle so that they wouldn't be thrown a curve that would alter their bargaining. This is at the very end of the process. They haven't even started bargaining yet, and uh, it only affects the arbitrator's decision, you know, one side or the other, or selecting the fact finders. And that's, we think it's better, uh, and because we're, wor I mean, the genuine worry here is we want the system to work. We came here willingly, wanted to work, and if one side or the other has an extreme position that carries the day for whatever reason, unlike the state system or any other system, we then go back to the local bargaining table and have to work out the details. If it's something is so extreme in the health care uh, agreement, if you will, or the arbitrator's decision, they're going to have to pound it out locally. And, and we just think that that's going to kick the can down to that group when it shouldn't be. We should try to allow the arbitrator to come up with a remedy that either works for both sides uh, or one or the other that's not so extreme. That's our, our concern. Frankly, we want the system to work. Um, the other is and currently, other issue that we think needs technical correction is under Act 11, currently as drafted, the um, first contract, but the, only the first contract allows for there to be a different health benefit for both teach for teachers and a different benefit for support staff. If the parties so desire that sort of difference of uh, health benefit for teachers versus support staff, we think they ought to be allowed to do that going forward. As it's currently written, they, we don't think they can. So if they can bargain, the idea is if they want to bargain for something, they ought to be allowed to do it and not have their bargaining hands tied in that regard. So we think that's, uh, again, that's a, it doesn't affect bargaining this year at all. It's in the out years, mm -hmm. um, and we think it's more of a technical fix. Uh, and, and just to reiterate, so while you were speaking, I can see Nicole is not in agreement. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I didn't see that. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm all for uh, unanimity uh, in terms of changes. So uh, I heard Nicole say that even though she agrees with the January 1 start date, she might, her organization, our bargainers, might prefer to bargain that together rather than have the state um, make that change. If the sides agree, we can easily make that change. In fact, we could probably do it in budget adjustment if it was something you agreed on right now. Um, but uh, again, I want to be protective of the unanimous agreement that we had about what was there. Now, in terms of, for those who might not have done a lot of work with labor relations or, or bargaining, there is a logic, there is a, a reason why if you have a situation where one of the offers is gonna be selected and you know it's either yours or theirs, they're gonna, the, the arbitrator's gonna be looking at what makes sense given comparable situations Etc. And so the arbitrator is looking to determine which is the sanest of the two, which makes the most sense. And so you're, it's, it's forcing people to put out offers that aren't extreme, that, are, that make more sense to the arbitrator. So not to say you couldn't adopt what Jeff is talking about and have three options, but they each have a logic to them. And the logic is usually 
people will argue that it will produce um, more productive results, less extreme results. So that's something without mutual agreement I would be very hesitant to, to change at this point because the agreement was that we were adopting that logic of everybody's got to try their best to get to the reasonable place and then the arbitrator theoretically has two reasonable offers and they're just trying to determine which is more reasonable. Right. I, I don't disagree in concept or academically speaking, but yeah. uh, the worry is once the rubber meets the road and folks are actually bargaining, um, that if there is, it's not to suggest that people are going to extremes, it's that if there is something that's perceived by one side or the other as extreme, they have a, a, a valve that they can release over here, which is the local bargaining. And I don't think anybody here thinks that we ought to exacerbate or pressurize that any more than, 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 than it already is. Um, and so that was our thought was, we want this system, the health bargaining, to work and allowing the arbitrator to find a middle road if, if under limited circumstances, under, as I say, under seller, it says, uh, da, 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 if the allows the final decision maker to elect one side's offer, uh, if it would would cause an unreasonable and likely produce an undesirable result, or it would likely result in a long-standing negative impact upon the party's collective bargaining relationship. So it's under very narrow circumstances that we're suggesting you go there. But the reason is, it, it's we're not trying to alter or pressurize the other bargaining that takes place. We're trying to come up with a remedy here just in healthcare that is, that is unique, mm -hmm. uh, that actually doesn't exacerbate any, any other problems. And I, I am so optimistic that an arbitrator will never be necessary in this <laughs> situation. We are too. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I, I think, ironically, going to a consensus-based model, you wouldn't expect that that would be um, some, I mean, for VHI, consensus-based model, uh, and then the same for the bargaining table, putting aside arbitration. I, I am hoping we will find that, um, you know, that agreement. We didn't get consensus-based uh, decision-making in VHI. <laughs> well, we, we got equal. We, we did get equality back on the board. Yeah. I, I was the one seeking to get consensus yeah. decision-making. It didn't happen, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, I'm just talking about the, the even balance. Yes. Um, as opposed to one side having the power to. So um, I hear all of those three asks, and, and they'll remain you know, theoretically on the table. As you go through the bargaining, if it turns out that both sides can agree on them, we can, we can work on them. But, but at least for the moment, I'm thinking we would hang back as a legislature and let that language work as it will and will watch it through the process. Fair enough. Um, yeah. The one other thing I think that I should add is, um, a nod to my friends at AFSCME, uh, we still have yet to develop on our side, Nicole's done it on her side, we have not yet done. Um, it's got to be locally ratified, uh, whatever agreement we come up with. I guess yeah. it would support your notion that we don't go to an arbitrator, because the arbitrator's decision is, is final and binding. There's no ratification. Right. Uh, but uh, if we do come to an agreement, we've got to get ratified by our side, and, and we're still developing a local system that gets more and more people involved. Okay. So that's still work for us to do, but. Yeah, uh, and that was very important to ask me. Absolutely, no, we're not, we're not shirking from it. There are there, there representatives on our yeah. group, and we want to do it, we just haven't done it yet, I, as far as I know. As I say, I'm not there uh, in their meetings, so. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Jeff? Questions about the NEA? Or yeah, so I mean, yeah, we, uh, stepping back, we from on NEA represents about 14,000 teachers and support staff in the state, and uh, we also represent uh, teachers and I think support staff at uh, two of the four historical academies, being Burton Burton and Thetford Academy. We have members there in both of those schools, but not at LI, Linden Institute, or St. Johnsbury Academy. Um, and we, um, are probably the largest provider of professional development in the state. Um, we mentor you know, colleagues and work with schools to do that, uh, provide a lot of professional development to teachers and support staff uh, along the way. Um, and 
bargain a lot of contracts. Every contract is open this year for bargaining. Um, so there's a lot of bargaining going on around the state. And Burlington agreed on one. Burlington ratified yeah. this week, I think it was, or last yeah. week? Last week, um, which was good because it was a strike last year. So mm -hmm. they committed to doing more intensive work, relation building, communication building, uh, et cetera. And they were serious about it, and it seems to have worked, at least in a one-year contract. Right. I mean, I think they, well, I, my understanding was a two-year, but I may be wrong. I thought it was a one-year. Man, you may be right. Anyway, um, the uh, it is a testament to the, both sides there. You know, coming out of a strike, a lot of times you hear stories of people being really upset and, and the wound, and, and I don't discount that in the least, but uh, here they, they made a, a really concerted effort to put that behind them, work on the relationship, and they did that, and they came up with an agreement that I think both sides are happy about. Um, maybe not thrilled by, but happy about that they got it done and behind them. And that was early in the process. Um, do the uh, rank and file members of the NEA support uh, support this change? I mean, have you had any pushback or any fires you've had to put out, or um, does it look like people are satisfied? I think, people, I think generally yes, uh -huh. but with reservations, in as much as we've not done this before, right? And there is a lot of curiosity and a lot of questions, and we are trying to be very proactive in getting information out, and I think there'll be more coming out in February as we. Uh, get closer to actually bargaining. I mean, a lot of the time is spent in the fall trying to figure out who we had on our team, what, you know, with their roles, what we were thinking, data collection with Nicole. I mean, we spent a lot of a lot of the hard work that we were trying to get done. Uh, we did get done in the fall largely, and uh, data is still a collection work in progress, but it is happening. So I think members are uh, hopeful, curious, interested. Healthcare is a big issue for, for folks. They've given up over the years um, a lot of wages to maintain their health benefits, and, uh, and that's because they value it. It's not just for them, the teacher, 80% of them are women, but their families, mm -hmm. a lot of them, their kids. And, and uh, so healthcare is very important to, to my members, and they watch this stuff uh, intently. So we'll, we haven't had a lot, a lot of questions, but we have had a lot of questions. Senator Perch? In your chronological recap of things, I didn't hear anything about the year the governor had proposed. It's it's not to get to political about it, but well, I'm understanding it correctly, right? That was 2017 uh, was a tough political year. Right. Same thing. And way. then it came after. So that was in 17, and that, that was 2017. The next year, you guys came forward and said, "Oh, let's figure this out in a different way." Basically. Right. Right. We. Um, had our annual meeting in the spring of 2018 and had a healthy, vigorous conversation about health care and uh, largely decided that um, the membership voted they wanted to try a different route and uh, one that we can get everything we wanted. It was, as Senator Bruce said, it was uh, something that we all uh, acknowledged that, that this was advancing the cause. And we want to see this work. And just to pick up on Andrew's um, point, uh, again, for, for members of the committee who might not have been following along really carefully, the last two years, the Education Committee was sort of ground zero for asks that the governor made in the very last weeks of the session, backed by a veto threat of the budget and the tax bill. And so the last two sessions, uh, I was here all of, literally all of June, um, and we passed a third budget to the governor with, you know, 14 hours left to go before the government would shut down, and he agreed to let it become law. So there's been a lot of brinksmanship um, without uh, putting a partisan spin on it. I think it's fair to say that it, it's just a, because of the way we pay for education through the property tax, it's a, it's a perennially infected issue. And so what I tried to do last year was have a plan for this committee to go through the end game. So this legislation was our plan. It was something that we knew the administration would be interested in. It was therefore something we could offer the governor in, in the event of the inevitable threat. And yet we wanted it to be something that the, the parties could agree on. So we produced the legislation, we stuck it in a folder, and 
left it there for most of June, and then it went into the final offer and the governor could accept it. All the way of saying, jump ahead to this year in May, probably there will be some frame that we can't yet anticipate that will dictate our lives. So I'm gonna be trying to do my best again to anticipate what that might be, how we might solve it, what this committee can do before, because uh, what happened the last two years is we gaveled out and then there was a, a sort of ad hoc bargaining team of me, Jane Kitchell and Tim Ash. Um, I don't think that's democratic and I think it cuts this committee out of the policy making. So what I tried to do last year was do the policy making in advance of that and I'll try my best to do that again this year so that you all have direct input into what we would ultimately say to the governor about this that or the other thing. I hope you're not suggesting we're here till June again this year. Yeah. And it's education not. that's yeah. that's front and center on the end. But, but I, <laughs> even if we're not here in June, I think in May we're probably going to be um, in, in some form of a, a dispute with the executive branch. And to the extent that we can work out something that will be amenable to them beforehand. Then. Really after that nice meeting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I will say that the you know the, the veto threat itself was not repeated in this state of the state speech in the way that it has been in the last two. Um, there was no I will veto, including the property tax. It was more like Vermonters are taxed enough, which is a different kettle of fish. Absolutely. Um, so thanks very much, Jeff. Thank you all.